Good morning. I want you to take God's word and turn with me to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, and as you're finding your place in Scripture, can we just say thank you again to Anthony Evans Jr. for being with us. First time in a year to be able to lead publicly like this. So grateful that he took time out of his schedule to come and be with us. And just want you to know uh, something that you need to know about me is I sing just like that. When I'm in my car by myself, what a talented family. His daddy can preach the paint off the walls. Great church in Dallas. His daughter, his dad's daughter, Anthony's sister, she can teach Bible like nobody's business. And and then he can sing like that. That ain't fair, all right? That is not fair for a family to be that talented. But uh, his brother is... Uh, that was the chaplain for the Cowboys. I believe he's still doing it. That is a a great family. We love the Evans family and uh, so grateful for them being with us. John chapter 15, this is week two of our Essential Church series. And the title of the message today, if you're taking notes, I encourage you to, all of the scripture references that we look at, all of the major points will be on the screen for you. But I just encourage you to engage in taking notes. You can look at it in your own time alone with the Lord this week. Go back to see something maybe you missed. Here's the title of the message. It is The Secret to spiritual growth. Do you remember when you were a kid how fascinated you were with having a secret or being told a secret? I mean, you'd be with a group of people, a group of kids, you'd bring somebody else over to the side, you'd take them away from the group and you would whisper to them this secret that you had. There was something about knowing a secret, having information about something that no one else had great being in on a secret. And what I found is it doesn't stop this fascination. It doesn't stop when we're kids. It goes into adulthood. I can't tell you the number of couples that I've had in my office that are getting married. And I begin to talk to them and ask them questions. And one of the questions is, hey, so where are you going to go on your honeymoon? And, and all of a sudden, a guy will just jump out in front of it. No, 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 no. You can't say that. That's a secret. She doesn't know until the day. Now, let me just tell you something. That wouldn't work in my house, all right? Uh, my wife, who is here with me today, and my two oldest, uh, just so you know, uh, you know, uh, she wants to be in the know, no secrets, all right? And I've just learned in my marriage, happy wife equals happy life, all right? And so that's how we uh, handle it. But isn't it true to get in on a secret? I mean, think about it in your business dealings. If you're in real estate, if you're in real estate and you get in on a, a building that's opening up in a location that you've been spying out, you get in on that before anybody else, that's a good day. If you're in oil and gas, and you get word on some wells that are hidden hot in a certain location before the public finds out about it, you, you know that secret, that's a, a good day. I Googled it this week in my study, just uh, wanting to see how many books out there have the title secret in the title. And there's hundreds of them. Secrets of closing the sale. Secrets to success and happiness. One of them was Unlocking the secret of your childhood memories. Some of you are thinking, I want to keep those locked up, all right? Uh, I have a devotional on my desk by Andrew Murray. It's called nearly every day, God's Best Secrets. Love secrets. In 2006, you remember when this book hit? Uh, you see it, it was The Secret by Rhonda Byrne. It went gangbusters all over, 30 million copies worldwide. Translated in 50 different languages. What was it that made this book so tempting to get a hold of? It was this idea that there's a hidden secret out there. And if tapped into it, your life will be more feeling. It will get better instantly. We love secrets. We love looking for secrets. We love keeping secrets. Some of us like telling secrets. That's another sermon for another time. But you know as well as I do. A secret's only good. It's only as good as the person telling it. I mean, I'll read Zig Ziglar's Secrets of Closing a Sale. I mean, he's got some skins on the wall. He knew what he was doing. Probably not going to read somebody that wrote the book Secrets of a Lasting Relationship and they've been married seven times. I'm not going to do that. Secret's only as good as the person telling it. And today we're going to learn the secret of spiritual growth. And talking about someone who knows what he's talking about. John chapter 15, these words that we're going to read come straight from the lips of Jesus. And so if anybody knows the secret to spiritual growth, 
Jesus is it. Let's look at our text, John chapter 15, starting in verse 1, reading through verse 11. The Bible says this, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. The secret to spiritual growth is one word found 10 times in the 11 verses that we read. It's the word abide. This is the secret to spiritual growth. It's that we abide in Christ. And he gave us an incredible picture of what it means to abide in Christ. He uses the imagery of a vine, a branch, and a vine dresser. Now, I think what you're going to find surprising in the message today about spiritual growth is that forever we have been taught that we grow spiritually by working towards something. We achieve spiritual growth. We arrive at spiritual growth. But what we're going to learn today, what Jesus teaches in this passage of Scripture, is that real spiritual growth is not what we work to accomplish, but rather it's what Jesus works in us and how the Father works on us. And so let's look at it in detail, the imagery. Jesus begins there in verse 1 by saying, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. This is one of the seven I am statements in John's gospel. It would be a great series to preach one day, just to go through the seven different I am statements. I am the door. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the good shepherd. Where here Jesus says, I am the true vine could be translated as I am the genuine vine. I am the real vine. I am the authentic vine. Keep in mind when Jesus taught, he was teaching primarily to a Jewish audience. And here he's speaking to his disciples, all Jewish. And in the Jewish mindset, whenever the vine was mentioned, their, would, their mind would immediately go to the nation of Israel because in the Old Testament, whenever the vine is mentioned, it's speaking of the Hebrew people. It's speaking of the nation of Israel. Let me give you some examples. Psalm chapter 80, verse 8 and 9. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. He's speaking of Israel. Isaiah 27, verses 2 and 3, verse 6. In that day, a pleasant vineyard, sing of it. I, the Lord, am its keeper. Every moment I water it, lest anyone punish it. I keep it day and night, verse 6. In days to come, Jacob shall take root. Israel shall blossom and put forth shoots and fill the whole world with fruit. Over and over and over again in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel is referred to as God's vine. The problem is this. Nearly every time it is mentioned and referred to as God's vine, there's disappointment in it. It's not doing something that it was supposed to do. It's referred to as corrupt, a wild vine, an unproductive vine, ripe for judgment. And so Jesus, he wants his disciples to know right out of the gate, that the true vine, the real vine, the authentic vine, it's arrived. It's not the nation of Israel. 
It's me, Jesus says. And this true vine, it'll never disappoint. And by abiding in him, your life, my life, we can't help but spiritually grow and produce fruit as long as we abide. That's why I say spiritual growth is not something that we achieve or work towards. It's something that Jesus achieves in us as we abide in him. That's not all though. Not only does Jesus work in us, God the Father, the one who's referred to as the vine dresser here, works on us. Look at it in verse 1 and 2. I am the true vine, my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So as it relates to God the Father, the vine dresser, he has two major responsibilities in ensuring that the branches on the vine produce fruit. Number one is if it isn't bearing fruit, the Bible says he takes it away. If it is producing fruit, the Bible says he will prune it so that it will bear more fruit. So let's talk about this. Let's deal with this right up front because many have used this passage of Scripture to teach that one can lose their salvation. After all, Jesus says if he's not producing fruit, he is taken away. They'll even add verse 6 here as additional proof that you can lose your salvation. Look at it. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. And so what's Jesus teaching here? Is he teaching, as some suggest, that you can lose your salvation? I don't think so. I don't think so primarily because look at the context. Look back at verse 2, the first part, one more time. Jesus says, every branch of what? Mine. Every branch of mine. Any branch that is his, is his forever. Meaning, if you've placed your faith and trust in Christ, you are trusting in his death, his resurrection, his shed blood to make you right with God. When you make that decision, whenever it was, whenever it is, at that moment, you become a branch on the vine. And if you are a branch on the vine, you will always be a branch on the vine. The question is, what kind of branch will you be? And you can answer that right now. You will either be a branch that is growing and productive and producing fruit, or you'll be a branch that is shriveled up and dying on the vine, so to speak. No growth, no producing fruit. I want to remind you the sole purpose of the branch is to produce fruit. Otherwise, you're like a branch that is gathered and thrown away. You're not fulfilling your purpose. So Jesus isn't teaching on salvation here. He's teaching on what has happened once salvation has occurred. And the goal is that the branch grows, that the branch is healthy, that the branch is producing fruit. And again, God takes his responsibility as the vine dresser to make sure that you produce fruit and are healthy very, very seriously. Let me just give you a definition of fruit. How do you know that you're spiritually growing? You're producing this fruit. Here would be a working definition. Just came up with this. Here we go. It's anything that is produced in our lives that flow from our relationship with Jesus. It's abiding. It flows from our relationship. It's not something we do. It's something that Jesus does in us that advances his kingdom in our life and the life of those around us. It can be seen in outward behavior. Fruit can be outward actions. It can be good works, but it's not limited to that. It has to do with our character. Remember Galatians 5? 
Verses 22 and 23, Paul writes and he says, but the fruit of the Spirit, he's speaking of this character in our life that is developed as we abide in the vine. He says this fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control. This happens as we abide. And again, growing spiritually, which is a core value of this church. If we're going to be the essential church, any essential, one of them is that we're growing in our faith, that we are spiritually healthy, that we are producing fruit. And God's going to do whatever it takes to make sure that's happening. First, the Bible says, every branch of mine, the first part of verse two, that does not bear fruit, he takes away. He takes away. So if this isn't speaking of salvation, what is he talking about here, taking away? Well, another way that you can translate this is use the word remove. Another way it's translated is to lift up. Think about it. The picture is of a branch coming off the vine, and oftentimes these branches would get in mud, and they would get in dirt, and they couldn't produce fruit. And so the vine dresser would come, and he would see that vine in the mud and dirt, and he would pick that vine up. It needed aeration so it could grow, and he would put it in a different place. He would take it away from where it was and put it in a different place. You see the picture here? I mean, the reality is some of you are branches on the vine. You've trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Sometimes we've heard in the Baptist church, once saved, always saved. I like it like this, if saved, always saved. And you're a, you're a branch on the vine. Once you're a branch, you're always a branch. We trust in Christ. But the reality is some of us are living in sin. You're in the mud and dirt of life, doing what you know you shouldn't be doing, making decisions that you know aren't honoring to Christ, and your life isn't producing fruit because you're in the mud and dirt of life. Doesn't mean you're not a branch. What it means is God the vine dresser through the teaching and preaching of his word today, if you'll allow him to, he wants to come lift you up and put you in a different place. He wants you to produce fruit. He's not taking you off the branch. He's lifting you up so that you can make sure you're getting all the nutrients that the vine gives and all the nutrients that the vine affords. And so, if you're not producing fruit, it's one of two reasons. You're not truly a branch on the vine, or you are, but you're not where you should be. And God the vine dresser wants to lift you up. Some of you here, you are producing fruit, a little bit at least. And what does the scripture say here? Little bit's not enough. Second part of verse two, he wants to prune you so that you can bear, what is it? More fruit. Now, I don't know a lot about pruning, but you can get anything on Google. And so I put in pruning vineyards this week. And nearly all of the images, it has the vine dresser, has some shears just like this, pretty sharp. I don't know a lot about pruning, but I do know it means to cut away. And what a vine dresser will do is he'll take a vine like this, and he'll look at it, and the Bible says that if it's, it could be producing a little bit of fruit, but it could produce more if the vine dresser just cut this away. Now look, these vines don't have feelings, all right? This vine didn't say, ouch. But uh, the branch didn't say, ouch. But remember what the picture is. The branch is me and you. And I don't know about you, but whenever God, the vine dresser, takes his shears to my life and begins to cut back, it never, ever, ever feels good. But here's the reality. God, the vine dresser, he loves us. He knows what's best for us better than we know what is best for ourselves. Whatever he does, he does in love. And I'm just here to tell you, God is not so interested in our feelings as he is our faithfulness and making sure that we produce fruit. And if it takes some shears to make it happen, God with his holy hand will do just that. 
So question for you, champion for us. Question for you. Not the person sitting to your right or your left, person in front of you, behind you. I'm talking to you. What is it that God needs to cut away today in order for you to produce more fruit? Oh, you may really like it. I mean, this relationship that you're in, I love that relationship. But you know it's keeping you from spiritual growth. And maybe today God the Father just needs to take his shears. Just cut that relationship. Because it's not allowing you to produce the fruit that he wants in your life. Or maybe you find your identity, your security, in your job, your position, your title. I don't know, accumulation. Maybe God today wants to take that vine and he's just looking at it. Oh, it looks good, but it could look so much better if we just cut this right there. What is it that God needs to take his shears to? Cut back in your life so that you can produce the most amount of fruit. Hey, it could be religious activity. It could be religious activity. You could be involved in every ministry and event program that Champion Force offers under the sun. You could be singing in the choir. You could be teaching a life group. You could come up here every time the doors are open serving. Don't equate religious activity to spiritual growth and producing fruit. The Pharisees were religiously active and Jesus had his most harsh words for them. Maybe today God needs to take those shears and just cut some religious activity to prune us so that we can bear fruit and be spiritually healthy. The language here of this pruning, of this taking away, it's in its present active tense, meaning that God the Father, God the vine dresser, he never stops. This is the goodness of God, the grace of God. When you become a branch on the vine, God, the vine dresser, he never stops searching that vine, looking at all of his branches, me and you, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, he never, ever, ever stops searching that branch to ensure that it's lifted up and put in a better place or something is cut back so that it can produce more fruit. He never stops. So if you're 13, 14 years old in here, you've trusted Christ, you've got years of God, the vine dresser, working on you so that you can produce most amount of fruit. If you're 90 and you're going to live to be 101, you've got 11 more years of God cutting on you, working on you. He never, ever stops. And I just want to testify to the goodness and grace of God this morning. I'm so grateful to him that he never stops. No matter what it feels like to me at the time, God knows what is best for me as the ultimate vine dresser. He knows what he has to cut away. And I just praise God for the times that even when it was painful, He cut it away. He lifted me up so that my life could produce the most fruit. We serve a God who's attentive. God who cares. Always checking out his branches. We can't do anything, anything apart from abiding in the vine. That's what Jesus says here. Look at verse 4 and 5. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. Apart from abiding in him, we can do nothing, nothing, much less be spiritually healthy and grow and produce fruit. So how do we, how do, we do this? champion for us? How do we make sure that we abide in the vine? Let me give you two statements in closing that'll help us ensure that we abide in Jesus. We abide in Jesus first by spending time with him in his word. I want the emphasis to be time with him. It's a relationship that we're after. Reading the Bible can become a religious activity if we're not careful. Know plenty of people who read the Bible, but their life's not producing fruit. They're going through the motions. It's spending time with Him. 
Look at what the scripture says, verses 7 through 10. If you abide in me and my words, my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified and you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. John would pen a few other letters. First, second, third, John, book of Revelation. He loved this word abide. Uh, listen to him use it in 1 John chapter 3, verse 24. Whoever keeps his commands abides in God and God in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Whoever keeps his commands abides in God. You don't know the commands of scripture apart from time with him in his word. This is why we launched last week the Essential 100 Bible Reading Plan. It's not too late to get in on it. You can subscribe to our daily devotionals here. It's just a way for us to all be on the same page, reading the same things together. This morning was Genesis chapter 22, great teaching on Abraham marching his son Isaac up that mountain and God providing a sacrifice. Beautiful. Why did we do that? To get us in the habit of reading God's Word, engaging with God through His Word. Because when we open up God's Word, and we allow it to soak into our lives and saturate our lives, what happens is the Holy Spirit begins to transform our character. He begins to change our desires. And the byproduct of this is spiritual growth, fruit. What did he teach in verse 8? When we bear much fruit, we prove to be his disciples. Don't tell me you're abiding in Christ if the scripture at your home is collecting dust on a shelf Monday through Saturday. Impossible to abide in Christ without spending time with him in his word. Second way that we can abide in Christ, ensure that we're producing fruit, spiritual health, is by spending time with him in prayer. Again, the emphasis, spending time with him in prayer. It's a relationship we're engaged in. Look at, look at verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, that's spending time with him in the word, ask whatever you wish, that's prayer, and it will be done for you. The idea is we spend time with Christ, with his word open before us, and we begin to pray his Holy Spirit transforming our heart, changing our desires. Of course he's going to give us whatever we ask for. You know why? Because we're so transformed, we are so abiding in the vine that what we ask, we know is God's will. He's always going to answer what we pray according to his will. And when we pray his word and it soaks into our life and we're abiding in the vine, what, what, what the vine wants, we want. And we begin to pray, of course God's going to answer that prayer. It's the way we stay nourished. It's the way we produce fruit. We spend time with him in his word, and we spend time with him in prayer. I love what God's doing here at Champion Forest. I've told the church before, I told the search team that one of the things that first turned my heart toward Champion Forest was the diversity here what God's doing, the unity in diversity. That's why I love this dream celebration. And I know it's my first year, y'all's ninth year, but I'm so excited about celebrating what God's doing. I mean, I've said it before, that the church of Jesus on earth should look like the kingdom of Jesus in heaven. And Champion Force, y'all have been leading the way in this in a lot of ways for a long time. So grateful. This is Martin Luther King Jr. Monday, coming up this Monday. It's always right to honor his work and his legacy in the civil rights movement. He left an indelible mark in our country that should be esteemed. I was thinking about it this week just in writing this message. It's amazing to me that you look at those in history who made a tremendous impact 
especially in the civil rights movement, fighting against slavery and just the injustices there. If you look at it, the majority of those who made such a great impact in this atmosphere, this sphere of life, they were Christians. I mean, Martin Luther King Jr., he was, the, he was a pastor, believer, the son of a pastor, the grandson of a pastor. His brother was a pastor. uncle was a pastor. Uh, another one I think of is Harriet Beecher Stowe. Like Martin Luther King Jr., she was raised in the home of a pastor by a dad who loved the Lord and would read portions of Scripture over her. Her family, white, mind you, uh, they would hide fugitive slaves in their home. They supported the Underground Railroad. They hated slavery, was totally against it. Harry Beecher Stowe is most well known for her book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which highlights the miseries of slavery, the harsh conditions, what it results in. And when she wrote this book, it went gangbusters. Matter of fact, she was invited to the White House, had a meeting with President Lincoln, and it's reported by her son that when she walked in the room to meet with President Lincoln, he said, so you are the little woman who wrote the book that started this great war. As I mentioned, she was a devout, devout believer. She didn't just write about the abolition of slavery. She wrote about Jesus a lot. And she, she wrote a little pamphlet, gospel pamphlet. And the title of it was How to Live on Christ. And you know what her text was for this little gospel pamphlet? John chapter 15, the text we're looking at today. And I want to read you just a quote from this little pamphlet. What she writes about spiritual growth and bearing fruit. Now, how does a branch bear fruit? Not by incessant effort for sunshine and air. Not by vain struggles for those vivifying influences which give beauty to the blossom and endure to the leaf. It simply abides in the vine. In silent and undisturbed union. And the fruit and blossoms appear as spontaneous growth. You want to grow spiritually? Of course you do. You wouldn't be here if you didn't want to grow spiritually. I mean, isn't it sad? Isn't it sad when a baby is born and maybe physically they don't grow? We pity that person. Or somebody doesn't grow up emotionally, in maturity. We look at that person with regret. And when we talk about them, it's a sense of sadness and remorse. We say they just never grew up. Well, Champion Forest, my prayer for me, my prayer for you, prayer for us as a church, is that people would never look at our lives and say, that's a person that just never grew up spiritually. No, we're going to grow. It's an essential and how do we do it? By abiding in Christ. Spending time with Him, with Him, with Him in His Word and with Him in prayer. This is the secret to spiritual growth. Thank you for joining us online. We hope today's experience encouraged and challenged you. At Champion Forest, we are passionate about all kinds of people coming to know God to grow in their relationship with Him and others, and then to go out and make a difference in the world. We would love the opportunity to talk and pray with you. To connect with us, just go to championforce.org connect. And hey, of course, we can't wait to welcome you on campus, in person, on one of our locations. We'll see you soon.